World War II has been across media for generations, but what is it about the time period that intrigues us? Is it the massive battles, the uniforms, or the funny mustache man himself? Well, it's a bit complicated. See, World War II was the biggest conflict in human history, and it only makes sense companies all about wargaming. Medal of Honor have a take on the bloodiest war to ever happen. But to me, there are a few that do it well in the strategy genre. Sure, you got Call of Duty, but many players like myself, who call ourselves strategy enjoyers, I know, yearn for a good RTS or grand strategy game to set in the fields in World War II. Born the wheat fields. While there are a few good out there, not many handle the formula like Company of Heroes. Released in 2006 by Relic Entertainment, the same people who made legendary RTS games like Dawn of War, or the Emperor! It's safe to say folks at Relic knew what they were doing. While I haven't played much of the first game, Boo, you stink! I know. Heresy. I played Company of Heroes 2 a ton still today. The games are well done and offer a unique style of play not seen in many other strategy games, even in others Relic's other strategy titles. Hold on. This whole operation was your idea. I know, that's weird, huh? Anyways, Relic captured something truly exciting with Company of Heroes. And with the poor reception of the latest one, Boo! I felt the time was right to dive into this classic RTS series and show you all why Company of Heroes is a strategy enjoyer's dream come true. First, let's talk story. For any of you that don't want any spoilers for the main story, I'm gonna try to briefly explain it, but some spoilers may be present, so you've been warned. The year is 1952, and our opening shot is of a depressing Siberian gulag. Colonel Cherkin of the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, the NKVD if you speak in Russian, interrogates his former subordinate over his journal detailing the man's experiences during the Great Patriotic War. It's here that we're introduced to our protagonist, Lieutenant Lev Abravinus Izakovich. Sorry if I butchered that name, my Russian friends. I'm not from the motherland, so Lieutenant Lev, we'll call him that now, remembers his first meeting with Colonel Cherkin at the start of Operation Barbarossa, using scorched earth tactics to halt the German advance to Moscow. Just a quick side note, the Russians view World War II in a different light than us. They sacrificed more, and they view it as the Great Patriotic War. I encourage you guys to look it up. This game is very historically Accurate. And anyway, he then leads Russian forces on a counterattack against the Germans at Minsk and several other skirmishes throughout the winter. It's a real nice to see the beginning depicted this way. As far as we know, the war was rough on the Russians, but we get to see the aftermath of it as it weighs heavily on Lev's mind. We later catch Lev in Stalingrad along with his unit. He states that the only reason that the Soviets fought so hard was because of Order 227. Uh, uh, it's a man who can slap but can also stroke. Alright Relic, guess we're showing war crimes in the chat, famously known for the line, not a step back. Order 227 established that each front must create one to three penal battalions. The battalions were consisted of mostly court-martialed soldiers or soldiers accused of disciplinary problems, usually middle and high-ranking commanders, and were sent to the most dangerous parts of the front. This take on the Russian side of things in World War II games was unseen at the time. Most of them were seen as heroes. It was kind of different for a strategy game to depict the Russians in such a dark light with such human atrocities but it is a little bit more historically accurate to some of the things, but it does come off kind of heavy-handed, as we'll see with some of the controversies to this title. Exploring the highly controversial Order 227 today would be unheard of. We all remember what everyone's reaction to this scene was back in the day. It seems very controversial, and it was in some countries. We will get to that later, but as a final history note for y'all, from 1942 to 45, over 420,000 soldiers of the Red Army were sentenced to the penal battalions. That's a whole lot of soldiers, and really puts our character's struggle into perspective. But Stalingrad wouldn't end in triumph for our hero, but tragedy. Near the end of the battle, Izankovich's men abandoned the line to rescue the lieutenant from a collapsed building that he was trapped under. For that, all the men involved were executed. I had a lot of time to think about those men and what they did for me, and the price they paid for their bravery. Ah, yes, your long hospital stay. Most educational, I should think, was Sergeant Pozharsky sharing the ward. Sergeant Pozharsky was certainly larger than life. 
being in his ward made the time pass quicker. Save for Lev himself, who was reassigned to the role of a war correspondent, a sort of war journalist. Safe to say Lev was devastated and was left a little bitter by it, but still believed in the cause and looked forward to his new assignment. With some hesitancy, Lev frequently talks about his men during the interrogation, and it's clear that what happened in Stalingrad still refuses to leave him. Tell me, comrade. When did you begin to lose faith in the cause? When we first met you were a true believer. In my men. I always believed in them. While recovering from his injuries that he sustained in Stalingrad, Levs meets Sergeant Pozarsky. Again, sorry for the pronunciation, my Russian friends. The two share stories, and Pozarsky tells Lev about the siege of Leningrad, how the Germans cut off their supply lines, starving the Russians that were defending the city. At this point, the Russian perspective is clearly one of immense suffering, and a lot of us players feel empathetic towards the Russians as the cost of this war is spiraling up and up. However, we also have seen some of the bad sides of the Russians, so it kind of leaves me conflicted. We see some of the atrocities they're dealing with, but we also see some of the atrocities they're committing. A little two-way street there. The meeting with the sergeant is what inspires Lev to begin writing his journal, one he would later try to share with the world and fully commit to his journalism. We will watch your career with great interest. This is one development that is seen as the beginning of the end for Lev. As we all know, the Soviets thought on exposing their secrets, especially these war crimes. Over the next few missions, you fight back against the Germans and eventually uncover a concentration camp, and man, Majinek was brutal. The scene doesn't show anything horrific, but the still shot, and if you listen closely, you can hear screams. Oh, it gives me the chills. He then meets up with Polish partisans who aided the Red Army in exchange for supplies so they could keep fighting the Germans. And watching as those partisans were betrayed and executed by the Red Army, the Red Army knows how to take care of its friends. Betrayal. Betrayed. Lev reports that incident to Churkin, along with showing the colonel his journal. But the colonel, however, does not share the same feeling of shock and disgust at the execution of the partisans. He views it as a necessary precaution, for the Poles would turn against the Red Army and fight them once the Germans were defeated. Getting rid of them ensures that such a scenario never comes to happen. Damn, Relic, didn't know we had a war crime buffet on our hands here tonight? At this point in the story, we begin to really feel for Lev. He wants to do the right thing, but the Soviet commanders are so worried about public opinion that they hide the truth and we all know it's bad, but in the day, the Russians were so hell-bent on keeping public opinion for the war positive that many stories like this were buried until long after the war. Of course, Lev protests, believing it to be wrong, but his words fall on deaf ears. Turkin reassigns him to a penal battalion, basically condemning the man to death. Abramovich, however, does not meet the fated bullet on the battlefield and survives through the rest of the war and even the assault on Berlin, still writing everything he sees, all the abuse of power and injustice in his journal. It's through him along with his back and forth with Churkin in the Gulag that we learn of the horrors he's seen, and it all is very powerful to experience. Even after the victory was achieved, the lieutenant was restless and without peace. After the war was done, Izankovich attempts to defect from the Soviet Union to show the world the true nature of the Eastern Front, but is captured and sent to the Gulag where we see him at the start. We finally concluding his interrogation. Churkin shocks us all as he kills the guard that was overseeing the interrogation and allows Lev to escape with the journal. Why? Because he discovered that he was not to survive Stalin's next purge, so he decided to go out on his own terms. As Lev escapes, Churkin takes his own life. The story is a masterclass of military drama, and I feel it's a major strong suit in the game. And after we see Churkin change of heart, our spirits are uplifted, until we hear the gunshot signaling him taking the easy way out. The game's writing is a standout feature. Dialogues are poignant, capturing the emotional weight of the conflict. Gameplay is interwoven with the cutscenes in a way that makes the entire game feel very immersive. Each cutscene, another discussion between Lieutenant and the Colonel, a conflict of beliefs and ideologies of the two men. The player sees the steel resolve of the Soviet Lieutenant begin to waver, faced with increasingly cruel and immortal decisions made by his superiors. Lev loses fate in the cause he is fighting for with each recollection. Going from a loyal soldier in the beginning of the war 
resort to attempting to defect to share his journal, trying to tell the tragic tales of his comrades that have been killed by their superiors with the rest of the world. Shurkin, on the other hand, remains stalwart in his beliefs in the Soviet cause and Comrade Stalin's orders, justifying each atrocious act by stating that such is the nature of war, and sacrifices must be made in order to win the war. Though ulterior motives begin to show, the two men recall their memories, revealing that it is not just about winning the war, but about winning the war and taking Berlin before the Western allies and Americans get the chance. It is not until the very end that Churkin reveals his own fate and the fact that he has never actually read a word that the lieutenant wrote in his journal. Not until he found out that he is the next head on the chopping block, learning that he would not survive Stalin's next purge, Churkin finally read Lev's journal in its entirety, which is what leads him to let the man escape and show the world the truth. Both characters serve a perfect contrast to one another. One who questions the actions of himself and his superiors, allowing the personal feelings to guide his sense of justice, while the other follows his orders blindly, finding justification for every action, no matter how long it may seem, in the fact that the war had to be won, no matter the cost. Company Heroes 2's gameplay is a delicate balance of strategy and action. For me, it's a classic with all the stuff that you get to control in battle. While the campaign features the Soviet Red Army as a new faction and takes the players to various stages of the Eastern Front campaign, from Operation Barbarossa to the Battle of Berlin, there are more DLCs that cover other regions of the conflict on the Western Front with the US and the British as well as the Wehrmacht and Oberkommando West German factions. Built on Relic's Essence 3.0 engine, the game showcases new improvements compared to the previous title, adding what is called True Sight system into Company Heroes 2 as a new line of sight. This system allows for more tactical planning and play and keeps you in the dark for when the enemy is so you've got to be more methodical and plan your ambushes and battle lines. Players command squads, tanks, and artillery across dynamic battlefields. The cover system forces thoughtful positioning while line of sight and destructible environments add realism. The tension of managing limited resources, that being fuel, munitions, and manpower, keeps players engaged. I can't tell you how many times I've pushed for a new sector to secure a resource and to find a whole new enemy armored column there. The result Resources are spread out in sectors, with certain caches being spread throughout the map, but the majority of the points give you munitions or fuel, with the caches giving you bonus resources. Most factions could put a fuel or munitions cache on a plain point to generate more so that there is a reason to keep a hold of your sectors. Sector is clear. Manpower is on a fixed rate per faction. It ticks each minute, meaning players gotta deal with what they have until they can get enough troops to replace beaten down ones. This mechanic promotes safe play with players, so learning how to approach engagements with a tactical edge will reduce casualties and allow you to bring more units to bear. Weather conditions are a major factor in gameplay with movement and action penalties applied to players' units. Since many battles in the Eastern Front occurred in winter weather, troops can die of frostbite if caught in the outside during blizzards. Bonfires protect soldiers from the cold at the expense of enemy detection. Players moving through deep snow will move at a reduced speed. Certain maps have frozen bodies of water, allowing for more movement options. However, players face the danger of being attacked from the other side. As a result, the ice can buckle under the weight of the units in movement. This is a master class of strategy, or it can be used as a get out of jail free card if you catch the enemy on the side of the ice as it cracks. Shoot the ice if you can using artillery or tanks and watch them fall. Overall, the gameplay is massively entertaining and holds up to this day due to the tactical superiority of the gameplay. Co2 still defines the word tactical in the World War II video game market. The game offers a rich variety of modes. The single player campaign consists of several missions, each with distinct objectives. Multiplayer caters to competitive players, cooperative enthusiasts, and custom game creators. Whether you're a lone wolf or a team player, Company of Heroes 2 has something for everyone. The game introduces the theater of war. In this mode, you see a little more about the Eastern Front with both the Russian and German sides of the war. Theater of war missions aren't as detailed as the Soviet missions, but don't get me wrong, they are sweet and offer a different perspective on the war. Side objectives such as rescuing civilians are prevalent in this mode as it's seen more as a mini campaign. With the absence of a clear storyline and characters, the focus is on the battles. Finding solo against the AI or cooperative in a scenario with a friend, you also complete challenges with each section as well that offer unique ways to play the game, like limiting your unit types or holding a certain objective with a timer. It's all classic RTS challenges we saw for the era, but Code 2 does it well. The skirmish mode is where boys become men. It's an all-around classic mode where you get to pick your faction, then the 
commander and any support you can muster as well as cosmetics for your side before committing to the battle. This level of customization was unseen in many games of the day, and Co. 2 not only does cosmetics well, but also gameplay customization, selecting what supports you get and reinforcements you can call in. Base construction is pivotal. Players establish resource points, production structures, and defensive positions. The strategic placement of buildings affects resource outcome and unit reinforcement. Balancing expansion with defense is crucial for success. Units can occupy civilian buildings and use them as a stronghold. However, not indefinitely. They can be flushed out from hiding via artillery, flamethrowers, and grenades. The building damage system from Company Heroes carries on over to the second game and is improved. Wooden buildings set afire will continue burning until they are reduced to cinders. Furthermore, buildings can be damaged by tanks and light vehicles driving into them. The destructible environment adds another layer onto an already tactically brilliant game. Multiplayer is where Company Hero truly shines. Engage in 1v1, 2v2, or 4v4 battles. The synergy between players combined arms warfare and strategic depth elevates the experience. Coordinating with teammates to outmaneuver opponents is both thrilling and rewarding. The multiplayer might just be one of the best multiplayer components of the first game, and that game was acclaimed as the best RTS multiplayer of its time. Go 2 definitely lives up such a high standard left by its predecessor. The game feels great in its execution of tactical multiplayer multiplayer as all tools we learn in the campaign and skirmish modes are put to the ultimate test in multiplayer. Overall the game modes provided in the game will source hours upon hours of true to life awesome tactical combat that still is hard to find in other games today. And I stand by that statement and that Company of Heroes is one of if not the best tactical RTS out there. Company of Heroes 2 meticulously recreates the Eastern Front real battles, units, and equipment are woven into the gameplay. The harsh conditions faced by soldiers, extreme cold, scarcity of supplies, and brutal combat are portrayed authentically. Stalin's Order 227 also plays an integral role in the very game as its own mechanic. The order takes effect if the player deploys fresh conscripts, frontnik squads, or penal battalions. A time bar appears on the left side of the map display. For that duration, players must not have their soldiers go into full retreat back to headquarters or else said soldiers will be executed for doing so. As beloved as both Co. 1 and Co. 2 are by their player base, Relic has sparked a good number of controversy regarding their portrayal of World War II and the Eastern Front from the Polygon website. An article written by Colin Campbell on the aforementioned topic states the following. Comments on forums and on Metacritic are testaments to the strong feelings that the war generates. In the same article, it cites Quinn Duffy, the game's director, who said that compared to the first game, Co. 2 paints a broader picture. Whereas the first game was more focused on a small group of soldiers, hence it did not attempt to create a wider view. The controversy did not end there, however. As in Russia and other post-Soviet countries, many people rejected the game, openly hating on its portrayal of the Red Army as cruel and inhumane, stating that the commanders and war tactics used were very overly exaggerated. A Russian blogger known as Bad Comedian made a video on the game and that very controversy, which sparked even more outrage and backlash escalating the issue to the point where thousands of people were petitioning on change.org to have the game removed from Steam and banned slash blacklisted in certain countries. Russian game publisher 1C Studios pulled the plug on distribution of the game due to strong negative feedback on 26 July 2013. Considering that the majority of the backlash that the game received in post-Soviet countries came from the players themselves, Sega, the game's official publisher, released a statement that they were taking this issue very seriously and are investigating their issues with all relevant partners. Whether you agree with Bad Comedian and other players that push back against the game for its portrayal of the Eastern Front or not, one cannot deny that the Second Great War was truly hell on earth that left very little room for humanity to shine through and that Company of Heroes 2 managed to capture that horror perfectly. I for one don't know if the events stated in the game are true exactly, but no one knows in war. The finer details can sometimes be construed and we looking back have to put two and two together, even though it seems very, very mysterious because the first victim in war is the truth. However, I do appreciate the story and Relic not shying away from a grittier, darker take on the Second World War because, as we all know, it was anything but bright for those serving on the front lines. The game really pulls no punches when it comes to portraying the war. The atmosphere is tense. In the Gulag, both men share regrets 
The tension in the interrogation is palpable. One man believing he is about to die, while the other one is certain his own death shall come soon. The conversation between the two almost serves as proof to Churkin that what he is about to do is not a wrong choice. What neither the player nor Lev actually knows up until the very end is that Churkin is a dead man walking, regardless of what happens after the interrogation of the lieutenant. The use of the journal and what Lev drew slash wrote inside to tie together the transition between the scenes is a very nice touch. Him recalling memories of his unit, of the surrendering German soldier that was granted no mercy and of the partisans that were betrayed also serves to add weight on top of an already heavy atmosphere. The ending itself is also left rather vague. As no Lev has been allowed to escape the Gulag itself, the fact that in reality no man has ever escaped the Siberian Gulag due to the below zero temperatures, being kilometers away from any civilization and the conditions being overwhelmingly ruthless, really leaves the player wondering if he managed to escape and share the stories he wrote in his journal about what was really going on at the Eastern Front in Order 227 with the rest of the world. The optimist in me likes to believe he was successful in his escape. However, the realist in me knows that escaping on foot from the Siberian Gulag was impossible. The guards themselves were so certain that no man could ever survive the winter cold of Siberia on his own without any food, shelter, or equipment that whenever someone did manage to escape, no search party was ever sent to find or retrieve them. War is hell and this game is not afraid to portray that, a fact that current war stories in video games and other media seem to have forgotten. Another YouTuber that I happen to follow closely, and if any of you are fans of his channel, may have noticed my reviews are a little inspired by his, known as The Act Man, made a review on another World War II classic title known as Call of Duty World at War, one of my favorites as a child too. And I'd like to highlight a comment he made about that game in which he used a quote to show that a true war story shows its uncompromising loyalty to obscenity and evil. I believe that both World at War and Co. 2 may appear different in their approach, but both have similar themes as war stories, as they both have uncompromising allegiance to obscenity and evil, as quoted by Mr. Ackman. This, to me, brings a tithe of realism into the game that can't be overstepped, and I believe it strengthens it as a learning piece of media, one that every history, military, and fighty enjoyer ought to experience. Let us look back at Company of Hero 2's example as to what a true war story really is. Now I want to talk real quickly about the tactical brilliance of Company Heroes 2. I have to say that Company Heroes 2 demands tactical finesse. Blinking maneuvers using cover effectively and timing abilities are essential. Victory hinges on smart decisions rather than brute force in this game. The game rewards players who think strategically and adapt to changing circumstances. The strategic mastery of the game is something to be commended. Many RTS games of the time and even after have failed ultimately to live up to Co 2's example. In this game you can't just bum rush objectives to win. You gotta take your time and methodically plan your attack or defense to assure victory. Company Heroes 2 also demands players to be reactive to situations as well. You can't sit back and relax once you're set up because the enemy can call in support or break your lines or your men. The same. And in multiplayer, oh the strategy sweats get going man. The AI can be tricked but giving other players these tools matches can last forever but eventually attrition will take its toll and someone will emerge victorious. Above all else, Company Heroes 2 commits completely to its tactical gameplay, dialing it up to the max. And anyone who comes for a strategic smart game, come no further than Company of Heroes 2. As I start to wrap it up, let me just add some closing thoughts. Now, critics generally praised Company of Heroes 2. Its gameplay, historical context, and attention to detail received many accolades. However, many bloggers, including Bad Comedian, as I mentioned earlier, called it pseudo-historian, as the game showed killing civilians in flame, questionable use of penal battalions, only as executions and no more, killing Polish soldiers just like in reality, focusing only on negative subjects of the war. As of the 31st of March 2014, Company of Heroes 2 has sold 680 80,000 copies across Europe and America. If those numbers do not speak on its behalf when it comes to how successful it is, I don't think anything else will. For me personally, I give it the highest rating I can. Drum roll, please. 10 out of 10 command posts. In summary, Coming of Heroes 2 is a view into the gruesome and unforgiving nature of the greatest war that ever befell humanity. There is some problems the community had with the DLC back in the day, but compared to this, oh my goodness! 
I feel like it's a mere footnote in a great game. And to end that, each DLC is very much worth it, and in the future, I may explore them as well. Those being the Western Front Armies, which is purely a multiplayer expansion pack, adding two new factions, the US forces and the German Oberkommando West, the Ardennes Assault, which is a short non-linear campaign that I might cover as well, focusing on the Battle of the Bulge, and the British forces, which was the latest installment, which just allows the British forces in multiplayer game modes as well as more multiplayer maps added. The game is a masterpiece for any history or strategy fan, and I feel like if you're either, you should experience it. Those expansions I can cover in future videos if y'all want. But that's the review, Strat fans. I appreciate you all for stopping by to watch. Did you agree or disagree with my review? Let me know what you think in the comments section below. And remember to always keep it strategic, Strat fans. Colonel out.